All right, let's get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the 59th Honors Colloquium entitled Just Good Food. This is my flight attendant por portion, of the, uh, portion of, the beginning of the beginning of this colloquium where I tell you that the, uh, the exits are back that way. The bathrooms, I think, are across the hallway. Um, and um, don't run up to the stage if anything goes wrong. <laughs> uh, the no photos or video recordings, that's important, please. Uh, and also, if you could turn off your phones, uh, well, maybe not turn them off, just put them on flight mode, or maybe not flight mode either. Put them on, don't ring, don't let them ring during this, uh, during this colloquium, that would be great. Um, I would like to now introduce to you our URI president, uh, Marc Parlanche, who will offer our first welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, good to see more people uh, coming. And also, I understand we have many people following online this evening. So welcome to you as well. I uh, thank you, uh, Karen De Bruyne, for your leadership and for running this year's Honors Symposium. So welcome yourself. It's, uh, it's really... Uh, uh, you know, just a very, very special uh, weekly event that happens on Tuesday nights. And I really enjoyed, uh, like many of you, the event last year. This, this is really an important forum. It serves an educational role. We also hope it sparks important discussions on important and interesting topics. And it addresses pressing global problems. And this year's topic is especially interesting. It's all about food. And as we know, it's, it's really an emerging global issue. It's exasperated by the war, uh, the invasion in e Ukraine, the fact that we have hydrologic extremes, and so we see flooding, but we also see extensive drought. Um, we have malnutrition, we have hunger, we have food prices going in different directions, uh, and we have obviously socioeconomic disparity around the world. And so there's many efforts at URI, and over, the, over this semester I hope we'll learn about some of them, but there's certainly a lot of work that's going through, uh, traditionally through the College of Environment and Life Sciences on agriculture. There's research that covers all colleges at the university, including the College of Arts and Sciences. We have extension programs, so there's quite an extensive outreach and working together with community. And there's a couple of other things that I would want to mention. There's quite a bit of work that's going on on sustainable aquaculture at the university. And then finally, we have a free farmer's market for students on Thursdays at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I think I have the times right on the quad. So that's, that's really important. And I'm really grateful to all the people that have been working to make that happen. So I'm looking forward to attending this fall uh, and getting to meet all of you. And I hope uh, you bring, come back and bring more friends uh, next week. And so I want to say thanks again. Thanks, Karen. And now we are honored to have Silver Moon La Rose uh, formally acknowledge the land on which URI is situated. Is Silver Moon? I had... We don't have Silver Moon. Okay. Can somebody improvise? Lauren, would you like to come up and improvise for us? <laughs> Lauren Spears, the director of the Tamaquag Museum. Thank you. <laughs> Kanupiam, welcome. Natasuis Makasani Pashao at Nahai Gansek, Natasuis Loren Spears at Englisha, Ni Nahai Gansek Nahantik, Kanupiam at Aki at Nahai Gansek, Katabatash Katantua Uchi, Sokanun, Ka Kacha Usha, Ka Niempa Og, Katabatash Katantua Uchi, Nukasaki, Katabatash Michonk, uh, Katabatash uh, Nitang Sawag uh, 
um katap tashkatantwa uchi ni tangsawag ni naj so hello everyone welcome uh first to our uh wonderful guest Winona Luduk um who you are in such for a treat because I've heard her speak before and it's just very moving and I'm just grateful for her to be here. And uh, thank you to all of you for being here on the homelands of the Narragansett Nation. And I said to you that I am Lorenz Spears. Um, I'm the executive director of Tamaquag Museum and my traditional name is Makasini Pashao and I am Narragansett Niantic. And I thank the creator um, for all the beauty that surrounds us, for the rain that gives us cleansing, for the thunder beings and the lightning and the storms that bring us uh, cleansing. And thanks to uh, Mother Earth, um, who gives us all the food and all the necessities that we need. Um, and if we care for Mother Earth, it will care for us. And so I just thanked um, for all of our relations. Um, and that includes all uh, plants, animals, those that fly, those that walk, those that swim, um, and those of us that talk. <laughs> so thank you, and thank you all for being here. Katabatash. Thank you, Loren, for doing that. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, and also, the, the Tomaquag Museum is moving to URI here very soon, so we're very excited about that. <laughs> so um, the Honors Program gathers a community of scholars, scientists, and artists to provide intellectual excitement and reward to all participants, students, faculty, and the public. And for over half a century, right, over half a century, uh, we have coordinated honors colloquia. Uh, as the new director of the honors program, I am, I am just thrilled that this is my first uh, honors colloquium experience. It's timely, it's important, um, and it's exciting. Uh, producing a series of this scope requires one to two years of planning. It's a long process and a large budget. Uh, so I'd like to thank first the colloquium co coordinators, uh, John Taylor, who is assistant professor of the Department of Plant Sciences and Entomology in the College of Environment and Life Sciences. John, can you just raise your hand or stand up? Thank you. Awesome. And then Marta Gomez Chiari, who can't be with us this evening because she's traveling, but she's a professor in the Department of Fisheries, Animal and Veterinary Science, also within the College of the Environment, of Environment and Life Sciences, uh, as, we, as we call it, CELS. So thank you to both of them. They've been doing a lot of hard work. Um, I would also uh, like to th give a huge thanks in terms of coordination to Anna Blake. Is Anna around? Anna's way in the back there. She is a superstar. She has been coordinating um, this this whole like all of the all of the details of this colloquium, um, and uh, and I thank her immensely. Um, I'd like to thank all of the honors um, program sponsors. Uh, the, they can all be found on the program um, and also on our website. We keep getting new sponsors, uh, so we're very excited about that. And finally, um, I would like to thank the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and the Eleanor M. and Oscar M. Carlson Women's Studies actual, uh, Annual Endowed Lecture for their support of this evening's speaker. Um, the Carlson elect Lecture Endowment has financially anchored the Women's Studies Program uh, for, um, I think, since 19, what, 1980. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of the first Women's Studies course taught uh, at URI in 1972, and that was also the year I was born, so to give you some context. <laughs> and, um, and now to introduce our speaker, um, we are very honored to introduce, uh, to, to welcome rather, Cassius Spears Jr., first councilman for the Narragansett Indian Tribe of Rhode Island and soil conservationist for the Rhode Island National Resources Conservation Services. Cassius, if you could come up. Thank you. Askui Kwasin Nitampawag. Winnie Kisuk Natasawis Cassius Spears uh, Jr. You'll notice, some of you may have noticed when we had uh, a little earlier, there's also a senior 
So if you see another person with a cowboy hat, you're pretty close, but not exactly in the right spot. Um, so yes, my name is Cassius Spears Jr. and um, I'm the first councilman for the Narragansett Indian tribe, uh, the Narragansett tribe, and I uh, thank Loren for uh, offering uh, those words of acknowledgement for the land. Um, that's important for us to understand that the Narragansett Indian tribe are the original, the original owners, the traditional owners of this place. Um, and uh, this, this land, and we're the, we still maintain that relationship, that stewardship is still a part of our, our lives and our life ways. Um, tonight I had the, the distinct pleasure of welcoming our, our speaker, and uh, it's a great pleasure because I can tell you, um, you know, at a tribal level, for us as a tribe, there's, you know, there's protocol. There's protocol on how we interact with each other and how we, uh, how we, um, um, relate to each other. And for us, for the Narragansett tribe, to be able to welcome another tribe to come into our, to our territory, into our land, is uh, there's protocol around that. There's, there's the ways you do it. And, and for us, um, it's not a, it's a really, really easy welcome to do because uh, Winona comes from the Anishinaabe people, and those people are, are our relatives. Um, there are relatives. Around here, we call our tribes that are around us sister tribes. Um, but the Anishinaabe people, the Anishinaabe, we look at those as our big brother. So they're, they're, they're the ones that when they come in to teach, to speak, we listen, you know, because they're our older relative. Um, so it's an honor for us as a tribe, as a nation, to be able to have her come here and speak on our lands and speak, um, speak in those, those teachings, that, uh, those original teachings, and to be able to express uh, some of the things that, uh, um, that we hold dear as indigenous people. I had, uh, on a personal level, you know, my, in my area I work for USDA uh, on a professional level and then uh, and from, as a personal level I, I'm a leader for the tribe and I, sometimes those overlap and, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be able to do the work, do the good work um, in conservation that not only benefits everybody, and the people to today, um, and helps everybody for today, but it's also um, enriches my, my soul as a indigenous person, um, as a conservationist. So in some of those times when, when my discipline aligns with my, my passion, my, who I am and what I am, I get to do things. And I got to go to a conference years back and hear Winona speak. And this is when I was young, I was a young, I was probably 26, and I just got elected to tribal council. I was a young tribal leader. And I got to listen to her speak. And it was a pleasure because when she was talking, some of the words really resonated with me. And she says, and I know she said this in many times, I may even say it tonight. I'm sorry, Winona, if I'm stealing any of your thunder. Um, but she, she told me when we were, when we were, when uh, the, the, the message that really resonated and came directed to me, and that was, you can't say that you're sovereign if you can't feed yourself. And as a young, as a young tribal leader, that really stuck with me, because at first it generated other questions. If I can't feed myself, I'm not sovereign. One of the things we pride ourselves in indigenous communities is being sovereign maintaining that inherent sovereignty that is before longer and older and before everything that's here today, you know, that we hold that sovereign and we maintain that. But the simple question, can I feed myself? Can I feed my family? I had to ask myself that, you know? And then if I can't, how can, if I can't do that individually, can my, my family, can my tribe do that? Can my community feed themselves? Can my tribe, my nation, can they feed our, our, all the citizens within our nation? Can we feed them? And as a young leader, I, that really perplexed me because, you know, you talk about other types of, you know, ways that we view sovereignty, but that's the basic essence of who we are, is that relationship we have with food and how, we, and how that relationship that food brings to all our other relatives, our human relatives, like, like my aunt says, I'm gonna call you my aunt, Loren, you know, all those relations how we relate to them is important, and that one connection point is food in many ways that connects all of us together. So that question is something that I posed to our tribe, and I said, well, you know, how can we call ourselves sovereign nations? How can we be a sovereign nation if we can't feed ourselves? And from that, in my time that I've been on council, we've built tribal, so we build that sovereignty 
we've built that, that pre -re -re uh, prerequisite of being sovereign, and that is building a food system. Building food system that's controlled and owned by us. One that we determine what our foods are, what our first foods are, what our um, ceremonies that are required when we grow food. Um, so we are able to do that, and we established a farm, a food sovereignty program and a farm that we still have today. So I'm, I, you know, part of me wants to thank Winona for creating that, bringing that knowledge, those teachings back to our people, a simple premise that comes to, back to the tribes here on the East Coast who have drifted away from that, that, those original teachings. Um, and so with that, I want to say, because I could talk here forever, but I don't, <laughs> you're not here to see me, so let's put it that way. Um, you know, I'm going to say this. I'm going to, it's a really a great pleasure to be able to welcome Winona, and, and she really needs no introduction. Um, but I want to say this, that uh, I thank you on behalf of the tribe for coming back into our, into our place, our home, and this is your home. Um, and, and I look forward um, to building those relationships with even further into the in future generations with, um, uh, with our tribal nations, with us as people, with us as a family. Um, so I thank you. And if everyone could join me in welcoming uh, Winona Duke. Anin, Anin Indoy Maganada Coloma relatives. Um, thank you all so much for the gracious introduction. It is, it is good to be in Narragansett territory back in our old homeland here. We used to live here before we followed a shell which appeared in the sky to the place where the food grows upon the water. That was our instructions as Anishinaabe people, to follow a shell which appeared in the sky to the place where the food grows upon the water. So that is... Uh, that is how significant food is to us, you know, and who we are. But I want to especially thank the uh, Don and Cassius and Cassius Jr. for being out, the Spears family and Lauren and uh, the president, Mark and, and Mary, for inviting me and, and uh, John for picking me up at 2 a.m. or whenever we got in last night. So thank you all for the honor of being here today. Ani Nindoe Maganado Kalomai relatives, Benesi Kwe and Dijinikas, Makwendo Deam Gababani Ka Gish Kanaganing and Dunjaba. Telling you where I'm from. I'm, I'm Bear Clan from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, Gawawagani Kag. And um, talk about food. I like talking about food. I'm a Bear Clan. We like to talk about food all the time. <laughs> When's the next snack? That's usually my question. <laughs> but um, this is uh, my community. This was taken two days ago on a uh, Lower Rice Lake, this is wild rice harvest. And that's a bunch of Indian men. There's a, I don't know if there's one woman out there. I think the hat might be, but uh, out there harvesting wild rice off of a lake. Uh, all you gotta do is take care of your water. Wild rice grows on lakes and rivers, it grows in my territory. It's the only place in the world it grows is here in, in the center of North America, the center of Turtle Island. and. Um, it's a vital way of life for us. You can see the amount of rice those boats are bringing off. 600, 500, 400 pounds of rice. Saw some guys knock 700 pounds. The guys over on the far right of the picture knocked 700 pounds. I was there. And um, so what you do is you go out on a lake with two in a canoe. You put your prayers out in your tobacco. You go out with uh, these, these sticks, they're called knockers. And uh, they look like long drumsticks. And then someone poles. You can see the poles standing up there. They push through the rice beds with the poles. And the second person takes the, the, pulls the rice over and knocks it like this into your canoe. That's how you do it for 1,000 years. And you can harvest rice in the same place for 10,000 years if you do it like that. That's a little lesson in sustainability, huh? How you can hang out for a while, just do the right thing, you know? But, um, this month in our language is called Mano Gizis, the wild rice making moon. And that is the reason, because it is when the rice arrives. The moon that follows this is called uh, Watebaga Gizis, when the leaves change color. 
Uh, we have a gosh, cod no geezes in the, in the freezing over moon. Manadu geezes soons, little spirit moon. Gitchi manadu geezes, great spirit moon. The maybin and geezes, that's a sucker moon. That's around February. Ona bana geezes, that's one of my favorites. Ona bana geezes, that's a hard crusted snow moon. March. Uh, freeze, thaw, freeze again. Also known as the, the moon you don't want to do a face plant in the snow. Iskigami <laughs> zigigizis, that's a maple syruping moon. And then uh, that's around April. And wabagana gizis, the flower moon. Odaman gizis, the strawberry moon. Mean gizis, that's the blueberry moon, that's July. You know, so um, why am I telling you that? So you could hear our language, it's a lot like yours, it's different. We, uh, you know, we, we, we have a different language, but it is the same language, we're Algonquin speakers, but, you know, did you notice that none of those moons are named after a Roman emperor? Did you see that? <laughs> it is possible to have an entire uh, worldview without empire in it. Look at that. It's all right. New England, let it go. <laughs> So um, this is the wild rice making moon and uh, you can have it for a thousand years and you don't need a Roman emperor. Uh, I'm gonna talk about food, which is about promises, dreams and intergenerational stories. This is some art by Steve Primo I really like about the seeds and the ancestors because the seeds are gifts from our ancestors to us and seeds that we pass to our descendants, they're gifts. And they're also about promise. Anybody who gardens knows that you put it in your garden and you're not sure how it's going to go or what it's going to look like. You know, a lot of prayers, a lot of love, a lot of visiting with your plants, right? So it's about hope and promise and faith. That's what gardening is about to me and that's what growing food is about. And that's pretty much what you need in life. You know, so it teaches you, teaches you a great deal. And uh, the art on the right is my mother's art. Her name is Betty LaDuke and, and uh, she's, she has traveled the world, and this is a G clay print of a, of a large panel that's probably about five feet tall and four feet wide and on masonite or, I don't know, pretty amazing. But, you know, I come from a, a farming family or a family that celebrates farms. But, uh, you know, I like to talk about making America great again. <laughs> and this is when America was great is when there was tremendous agrobiodiversity, when there were 10,000 varieties of corn, now that was great, you know? And those uh, 10,000 varieties of corn, they were not developed by Monsanto or Syngenta. They were developed by people who looked just like me. You know, on a worldwide scale, people looked just like me, developed all this agrobiodiversity by figuring out which corn was good and how it finished and selecting it from, because corn doesn't exist in nature. In, in nature, it's teosinte which is a tall grass with cool little kernels on it. And so, you know, corn is an example of what humans can do if we are, do the right thing, you know? Corn was created by humans and the creator, all of those varieties, you know? And uh, my suitcase did not arrive, but maybe it'll show up, they'll bring it in, and then I'll show you my cool corn I brought you to show, but um, I grow cool corn. Uh, but my point is, is that, uh, Agrobiodiversity is, is uh, when things are great. And uh, biodiversity, 50 million buffalo, that's when America was great. When there are 50 million buffalo and uh, they were the single largest migratory herd in the world. And they uh, transformed ecosystems, built topsoil. And you know, interestingly enough, a buffalo, oh, how did that happen? Hey, I didn't say you could do that. Um, a buffalo, uh, where there's 50 million buffalo today, there's about 28 million cattle. And those cattle take an entire fossil fuels economy to support them. Grass and hay and grain and feedlots and soybeans from Brazil, <laughs> right? Well, those, those buffalo, they don't need that. In the wintertime, I, I had the privilege of watching buffalo out at Yellowstone. I was trying to herd them, keep them in, which was a crazy idea. But they, you look down there and they go like this with their head, and they go down there and they go get their grass in the middle of winter. They live on 
250 different species of prairie grass. So they have tremendous biodiversity that buffalo live on. A buffalo will, will walk into a storm, a cow will flee it. That's why in times of climate catastrophe, which we are in now, uh, 100,000 cattle died in 2013 in South Dakota in a freak snowstorm. 30,000 here, I don't know, last year, a couple years ago, they had another big death of the animals, you know, because those guys, like most, like a lot of things that are created by industrial society, they, they, they don't know how to adapt, you know. So I'm kind of betting on buffalo over the long haul, not cows. I like cows, but buffalo are smarter. That's when America was great, when passenger pigeons darkened the skies. You could drink the water from every stream and creek. That's when America was great. And so I want us to remember that because one of the things that Americans sadly suffer from is, is a good case of amnesia, historic amnesia, where we don't know and didn't know the people who were here and the people that still are here. And then we suffer from ecological amnesia. That's what someone called it. It's like where you didn't know that there used to be a shell midden here, or you didn't know that there used to be wild rice here, or there used to be trees. So we don't want to be the people that, that suffer from amnesia. I want to remember and I want to bring them back because that is the opportunity we have. So this is my wild rice on the same lake you saw those guys on, same landing actually. This is uh, Lower Rice Lake. That's a lake full of rice. That's not a pasture. That's me and Don Goodwin out there looking at our rice. Got my little tobacco in my hand. We're like, what do you think, Don? She's like, looks good. It's a lot of rice, huh? It's a lot of rice. So that is uh, you know, what we protect in my territory because on a worldwide scale where there are indigenous people, there's still biodiversity. They say that we're about 4% of the world's population and 75% of the world's biodiversity. That's because we live where the wild things are. We're the ones who protect those things. And that's why it is like so important in these times of chaos and crisis that indigenous people are understood as protectors of our land, of all of our land. And that it is important to support us in our resistance, but it is also important to, to learn from us because uh, we got an idea how to hang out for a while, you know? So the conflicts that exist are uh, long-term. The ones that we face today are, are conflicts that, uh, you know, I like this picture of Sitting Bull and Custer. That's who that is. And, um, you know, it's two different worldviews. I call one a Windigo paradigm. Windigo, Windigo economics. And that's the economics of uh, this society. A Windigo is a cannibal. I first heard that term, I was up in Canada, and I heard this Canadian Indian guy facing clear-cutting, he said, uh, sitting down and talking to the Canadian government's a lot, a lot like sitting down and talking to a cannibal. Because make as much small talk as you want, but in the end you know exactly what they're after. So what am I saying? I'm saying, look, it's been a long haul and there's two different worldviews, and it is perhaps manifest as organic and GMO, but it is, you know, we are at this moment in time where there is a lot of, of uh, chaos around us. There's a lot of chaos around us, and, and uh, so it is our time to, to do something right. But first, I have to depress you by saying what's wrong. And uh, to start with, it is the enclosure of the commons. So, as I said, we are the people of the agrobiodiversity. This is Wills, which I think eventually was pioneer seeds, and I think that now it is Syngenta. But you can see the origins of agrobiodiversity in, in northern, uh, this is from North Dakota, and many of the corn varieties that are grown today. If you look in this picture from their seed catalog from 1919, you can see uh, Mandan farms on the Missouri River. That's what those are. Those are Mandan earth lodges on the Missouri River with the corn varieties that came from the Mandan people. That is the same place where the Standing Rock battle over the Dakota Access Pipeline was fought exactly in these locations. They say the Missouri River was like the Nile River Valley, the fertile crescent of northern agrobiodiversity. And uh, today those seeds are held not by us, 
You know, the increase of industrial agriculture has been dramatic. Some people talk about alternative agriculture, but, you know, really industrial agriculture is an aberration of 10,000 years of agriculture. You get a lot of fossil fuels in it, get a lot of money, get a bunch of technology, and it looks like that. That's what it looks like. And what we know today is that, you know, today we have uh, not much topsoil left. A huge drawdown of the Oglala Aquifer, and that which remains is, is in peril. You know, and uh, even the seeds themselves are owned by fewer and fewer corporations. So once the seeds are the commons, you know, the agrobiodiversity of the world, today we find that uh, these guys, 2008, six com com companies had the majority of the world's seeds, about 60%. By 2022, they had done more mergers. As you recall, Bayer bought Monsanto. Remember that? Oh, no, that was a few years ago. And uh, DuPont and Dow merged, Syngenta. So now you have uh, four big seed companies that control 60% of the world's seeds on the commercial markets. No, that becomes a problem for many reasons. Uh, first, I, don't, I fundamentally don't believe that life should be owned. I don't believe seeds should be owned by corporations. I believe seeds belong to themselves and to farmers. That's what I believe. But more than that, the concentration of seeds in the hands of, of fewer and fewer farmers means reduced access and reduced diversity in seed varieties, and a push certainly towards increasing amounts of genetically modified agriculture and high, high petroleum input agriculture. You know, they say that the average uh, Meal travels 1,400 miles from a farmer to the table. You know, I was an economic student at Harvard, and there was a lot of talk about the economies of scale argument. <laughs> the, the thing is that size matters, and large is not good. Why am I saying that? Because we just witnessed that in the pandemic. We witnessed the collapse of big agricultural food systems the plowing in of farm fields, the tossing out of vegetables, the destruction of millions of little pigs and little chickens. They couldn't get any place in a timely manner and a bunch of stuff rotting, right? You know, uh, big is good if you're a corporation, but not good if you're trying to eat the food. And it's also not good to travel that far. A tomato shouldn't travel 1,400 miles. A tomato should be a local thing. So, you know, we have created this system, or we have allowed the creation of a system based on a lot of greed, which concentrated an immense amount of energy and power in the hands of fewer and fewer. But fortunately, there's been resistance on a worldwide scale. In uh, 2020, Mexico banned GMO corn. Why did they ban GMO corn? Mexico banned GMO corn because it was messing with their corn. They also be, they, they wanted to protect their indigenous corn varieties and their farms themselves. It was a long and drawn out legal battle with Monsanto, I believe, at the World Trade Commission and in other entities, but reaffirmed uh, most recently. And, uh, you know, this is what they are protecting. That's pretty tremendous agrobiodiversity. And it is grown by people who look just like me. You know, maybe a little shorter, but by and large. You know, indigenous people, you know, growing their farm, growing on their farms. And on a worldwide scale, you know, farmers are resisting the enclosures, the enclosures of the commons and the enclosures of the seeds, whether it is in India with the movements of Vandana Shiva and others, or it is, you know, the work, I, our, our organization, our work at White Earth, our, our wild rice, our monoman was awarded the Slow Food Award by, uh, um, in 2003. So I began to go and travel to visit Italy where the slow food people would come in from around the world and I, I would just be marveled and, and weep some days at the, at the resistance of farmers to the GMOs and to the taking of their land. And, uh, you know, indeed, 
in the times that we are in, it is essential that we relocalize our food. So this is my little geeky study of in 2008. Oh my gosh, that's a 14-year-old study. I could do a new one, but I'm busy. Okay, the, uh, the point was, so this is my reservation. And, and uh, when you spend your money on food, as opposed to you harvest it, because I come from a large harvesting economy of wild rice and maple sugar and fish and farming, we spent 86% of our money off reservation buying food. And so, like I figured out that the Amish economy has a, like a five times a multiplier. What am I saying? A multiplier is what you want in your city. You want the money to come in and to circulate. Cruise around a little bit. You understand what I'm saying? Like capitalize some other businesses, little guys. But when you get Big Ag and when you get Walmarts and all those guys, what happens is the money goes off and it doesn't come back, right? And so like, you know, one of the basic things of economic wealth is to not have a hemorrhage in your economy. That's a good way to keep stuff around. Instead of having it, you know, uh, move along, right? So we uh, um, have spent a lot of time rebuilding a local food system in my community. Food ways, rematriation of seeds, and uh, a lot of that was strengthened during the time of the pandemic. But this is one of our seeds. This is a gete ocosamen, is what we call this squash. I grow, I farm, and I grow corn, beans, squash, potatoes, purple potatoes, that's my specialty, Jerusalem artichokes and hemp, and then a lot of cool garden vegetables. This is uh, called gete ocosum in the squash. And the story I heard was that it, it grew in a, um, that it was, the seeds were found in a archeological dig in Wisconsin. And in that archaeological dig, they found a clay ball. And in that clay ball, they shook it, and there was something, and they cracked it open. And there were these seeds. Now, I just want you to think that through. Why did we use a clay ball? Well, because a clay would wick out the moisture. You could bury it, could keep it underground, right? And apparently, you could keep it for 800 years like that. Not bad thinking. You know? And I think about that, because in this moment that we're in, there's a lot of interest now in seed preservation, and you got the Norwegian, the vault, right, in Norway, but didn't they have like some climate change related problems? They had a little flooding in there this year or something, right? So my point is, it's like, you could have all the technology in the world, but maybe you just needed a clay ball, right? And what you need is the people to own the seeds and not them to all be concentrated. Like, I, I think it's good to keep large seed libraries, you know, but it is also good to just keep seeds and have them accessible by farmers, you know? So this, uh, someone gave me this, this squash seeds to grow about 10 years ago. Oh, I've lost track of time, maybe 13, 14 years ago. And I uh, was hesitant to grow them at first, and then I grew them out, and they look like this. And I was like, that's cool. That's cool squash. And uh, they keep really well. The thing about a squash is that it's, uh, like a carbon, reduced carbon food. What am I saying? Like a zucchini, a summer squash just hangs out for a little while, but a winter squash will hang out all winter. In fact, I'm still eating some spaghetti squash from last year. Huh, you just keep them up high and dry. And so it doesn't need to be like frozen or canned or processed, you see what I'm saying? And so it kind of has its own container. That's why squash is super cool. And uh, so this squash, I grew it out, and, and then uh, someone corrected me. Of course, I had to be a white guy. He said, it's really not a, was well, not a, from an archeological dig. I found another study that reported it was a Miami squash, some Indians from further south. He said, and, uh, and it was uh, in a seed collection that they deemed to be 1,000 years old. I was like, okay, that's good. I mean, you know, my 800-year-old, Date was wrong. <laughs> he was correct, I'm sure. But uh, um, when I grew it out and I started talking about it, people kept saying, what's that called? What's that squash called? 
I was like, I don't know. I mean, they gave me the seeds, and I was like, well, I'm going to name it, right? Because, you know, white guys name stuff all the time. Did you ever notice that? They're busy naming everything. My God. They're naming it all kind of after their relatives and their evil Amherst guys, and oh, my God. So anyway, I was like, I'm going to name this squash. So I named this squash. I call it Gete Okosaman, Gete Okosaman, which in Anishinaabe Moen, in my language, means really cool old squash. And so you know how you've arrived? Last year I saw this in the Baker Seed catalog, right? And they always asked me if I'd sell it to them. I said, no, I don't sell squash seeds, you know, but someone did. And then they, they, they grow it and sell it. But it's called Gete Okosaman in the catalog. I was like, we have arrived, ladies. That's cool, huh? So anyway, that's my cool old squash that I, I grew a bunch of them this year and a bunch of Lakota squash. The Lakotas did a lot better in my gardens. This is my farm. Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm, where I grow all kind of cool vegetables. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But during the time of the pandemic, what happened is, is that uh, all these kids moved onto the farm because uh, they couldn't go to school anyway. And so who would you rather hang out with in the housing projects or with Auntie Winona and your horses, right? So this is our first attempt at horse farming with a pony. As you see, this is a three-person, one-horse operation. <laughs> I just have to show you that we weren't pros to start with. We had to evolve over time, right? But, you know, um, we can talk about a lot of things, but a horse has a lot more power than I do, right? And so I'm interested in pre- and post-petroleum agriculture. That's what I'm interested in. And, and it turns out that all our stuff was pre-petroleum. You know, it never got grown, it never got commodified, it never got sold big because, uh, you know, we aren't going to do that. Uh, it didn't make the cut. Monsanto had other stuff, but so we hung around and, and uh, we tilled up with our little pony Orion here. And, uh, but it turns out that, you know, the a farm, if it's 70 acres or under, it's not only a cyclical farming system, but it is the most efficient farming system is with horses. And so why would you do that? Oh, that's right, because they eat local and they create their own fertilizer, right? They're a lot more pleasant than a tractor. And uh, that's cool, you know? And they have a lot more power than you. So then we upscaled, we like that. Those are ponies. That's Orion and Pegasus. And uh, they're putting in a cornfield in basically what was formerly a dead zone occupied by an agriculture company, RDO Offit. And then, uh, this is the Amish barring my horses. Look at that. My two are on the outside, kind of slagging behind the beautiful Belgians. But uh, that's uh, a cornfield being put in by the Amish with my horses. And then this is some of our corn. And some of my granddaughters, Terry Sue. Um, so those kids moved in with me because they didn't have anything better to do and because I was fun. And so during the time of the pandemic, I basically like a lot of other people, didn't go anywhere, but stayed on my farm and grew more and more and more food and learned a lot more about growing and a lot more about farming with horses and spent a lot of time with horses and with my neighbors who all are all Amish. And so it was a great bonding and uh, we still have our cool. This is some of our plants. This one over on the far right is the great pumpkin. Is that the coolest pumpkin you ever saw or what? That's like the giant pumpkin. These are some of my kids. This little dude on the far right with a pumpkin, he just asked me to adopt him. I thought that was the sweetest thing. I was like, wait, you can become a mother at 63. How great is that? <laughs> so in a couple months, I'm gonna go be his formal mother. That's great though, huh? At 63, just a miracle. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let me see how I can. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so this is, uh, I look like a hippie in my hemp field. I do. It's like my, totally my 70s picture. This is me going into my hemp field, which was at that year on tribal land, adjoining this farmer. And the farmer complained to the tribe that there was uh, noxious weeds. So I was like, wait, let me go see. And I was like, oh, like these? Like noxious weed? I was like, so this is my uh, seven or eight foot tall hemp plants. So I'm a fiber hemp grower. 
That's what I grow. I can't, I don't grow anything that you can get high off of. Everything I grow is less than 0.3% THC. And I'm interested in hemp because hemp is going to change the world. Um, and I call it the new green revolution. And I call it the new green revolution freely because the University of Minnesota claims that they had the father of the green revolution there, a guy named Norman Borlaug. So I was like, well, I want to be the mother of the new green revolution. How's that? You know, but we actually need doulas. We don't need one. In order to do this, you need a whole bunch of growing. Because if you're going to change the world, you can't do it just in your garden. You can, but you got to start, get bigger than that. So this is a little bit about hemp. And that's to say that to start with, let's just put it this way, the word canvas comes from cannabis. So that means that everything that was made out of canvas, like all of those sails that your ancestors came on, that would be out of cannabis. That would be out of hemp. Those are hemp sails. The uh, rope. And then you just start from there. I mean, Henry Ford made a car out of hemp. Uh, pretty much anything in the materials economy, any bioplastic. My favorite is this new hemp wood and this hemp insulation. The building industry should just be revolutionized by hemp. Because you could, for instance, hemp herd. Hemp herd becomes a hempcrete. And you could replace concrete, which if it was a country, concrete would be the third largest source of CO2 emissions in the world. Concrete. We got all kind of concrete, and we don't need all that kind of concrete. You don't need concrete and everything. So let me just explain a little bit about the plants that I grow. This, a tall, a tall, you know, I'm sure that you've seen pictures or you've seen cannabis plants. They look like a Christmas tree, right? That's the females, and everybody is smoking bud. That's what you want on those is bud, right? On mine, what you want is pretty much the seeds and the stem. Because the seeds and the stem the exterior of, the, of it is where the fiber is. And that's about 30% or 25% of the plant is the fiber of, of, the, of the stock. And that is what you turn into textiles. Um, the remaining 70% is herd. And the herd is what you can turn into all kind of building materials. And so um, I'm interested in, and what we are doing is building an intertribal hemp cooperative in my region because my tribe has 837,000 acres of land. The tribes next to me have millions of acres of land. And a lot of that is the kind of land that you would want to grow this hemp economy on. Now why I'm saying that is because if you have 50,000 uses of it from fuel to varnishes to, you know, concrete, or hempcrete to uh, textiles, you need a lot. And hemp also sequesters carbon at the fastest rate of any field crop. Now if you think about it, this is how it works. It grows really tall, really fast, and when it grows really tall, really fast, it uh, pulls down a bunch of carbon in it. And when it pulls down that carbon, it gets into its little body. It also grows, as far as it is up tall, it is down below. Because it has to have a mass, a root system, which is kind of like a root ball, with which to control that height. Y'all follow me on this? And so because of that, it is also really incredible for bioremediation, which is taking heavy metals, pretty much, out of your soil. And I'm telling that to you in New England because there are plenty of super fun sites that would do well probably with some hemp. You know, so I'm saying is that this is a miracle plant. I like this quote, we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy and we made the wrong choice. Around 1938, Marijuana Prohibition Act, um, hemp was criminalized in this country. Not criminalized everywhere else in the world, but a lot of the world it was criminalized because the United States wields great influence. Criminalizing hemp on a worldwide scale, including countries like Japan that had a hemp economy that was their primary fiber source, criminalized it across the world. And in that process, there was a lot of reasons people say it was criminalized for, you know, because we we're all getting stoned. It was criminalized because the paper industry wanted it criminalized, the textile industry wanted it criminalized, and the oil industry wanted it criminalized. That's why it happened. But the implications are that we could have done everything we have done with fossil fuels with hemp. 
And it's so close, the word carbohydrate versus hydrocarbon. I think that's so interesting that they are so close and we just made the wrong choice. So now is our opportunity to bring it back. This is my hemp field a few years ago, Kula, my extended family. We all still work on the same stuff, huh? Cool, but you can see that it doesn't look like anything you wanna smoke. People say, you know, I was like, no, you don't wanna smoke that. <laughs> just get a headache, go get yourself some cannabis at the dispensary. And then here's the, you know, the growth of the industry. So I feel like the potential of the cannabis economy is pretty tremendous in terms of not only legalization, but in terms of the transformation that is potential in the hemp economy. And my interest is in making sure that indigenous people and people of color at the table, not on the menu. You know, in the last economy, the war on drugs took a very heavy toll on us. Criminalization of people of color for having a joint is much higher than the criminalization of white people. And so my interest is in the next economy, which should be equitable. And people like us who have the land, we should be able to get our land back and farm hemp. So that's our, what we're growing. So this is a, a little bit about land back and the intersection between land back and food. You all don't need this map, but you know, basically that's what happened. 99% of our land is held by someone else. That's pretty much the story of Indian country, including a lot of land grant colleges, but sadly yours doesn't have any. <laughs> and didn't benefit. I heard the story that Brown got all the land grant land, then didn't pass it on, these. But here it is, and so um, I'm interested in the intersection between food sovereignty and land back. Here's uh, one of my nephews and our, riding one of my horses. His name is Wasu, the kid's, the kid's uh, name is Leroy. And uh, we had some horse competition on land, and this land was formerly owned by the Enbridge Corporation, a com company that tar sands pipelines shoved down our throat after seven years last year. Fought them for seven years, tried everything, went to court, didn't miss a hearing, didn't miss a beat. But oil is an addictive substance and addicts make bad decisions. And so we got a tar sands pipeline through our territory and, and uh, the corporation, Enbridge, Canadian multinational that controls a lot of the Great Lakes these days, they bought the land around my organization. We had 40 acres, little demonstration farm, and they bought the land on two sides of it so they can conduct surveillance on us. That's what they did. And, uh, and they did a lot of surveillance on it. We used to do our best dance routines at the window, you know. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing, guys? I don't have any trade secrets here, you know. I'm gonna, um, but anyway, so um, we got that land back, and then this is to show you what land on our reservation looks like, okay? So uh, all those dots, those circles are industrial ag. They are on our reservation. That is largely RDO Offit, which is the single largest potato farmer in the United States. They farm for McDonald's. Those French fries come from my reservation. And then there's this Alex Bishop. He's moved in there. I don't even know that cat. And then those two parcels at the bottom are ours. And my village is right above that. I was like, can you fix that map, my friends? But you could say it's Pine Point, that's my village. And so what we did is we started buying out the land owned by the jerks right next to our village, basically. And that land, the one on the left, is full of hemp. I put in 60 acres of hemp on that land. I have a hemp maze. I'm gonna get a lot of children lost and crying in there in about two weeks. <laughs> It's fabulous, they don't even know, but I have, I have the drone shot that shows you how to get out. That was a good move for me because I would get lost in there too. Meth but you know, so this is what land back looks like. You know, and in order to grow your food as, a native, as native people or to be sovereign, you actually have to have your land. And so our work is um, over the last year, we purchased uh, 800 acres of land around our reservation and uh, throughout our ecosystem to protect it. And the purple land is the land that I'd like to go after next. You can see that farm adjoins. And this Big Rush Lake is, a, you know, you can see that there's a, a tremendous biodiversity to the, to, in this area, but then there's these guys, so. But this is how our story continues. This is my attorney, <laughs> Parching Wild Rice. You know, so in the midst of everything, there's some things that are for sure, and that is our food. And so we fight to, that's why we were fighting the corporations because we wanted to protect our rice from oil. And uh, so here is our attorney protecting it. 
But you know, over the long term, when I figure out what I'm gonna take my futures in, it's, it's probably hemp and buffalo. Why am I saying that? Because I don't know what my 401k is gonna be worth or your 401k is gonna be worth, you know? But I know that if I can feed my families, you know, if I can heat my, and we've got enough energy and food, we'll be okay. You know, my future is really tied up on if I could drink my water. My future is tied up in if I can, you know, live good. But this is the signing of the Buffalo Treaty. That's what this is. This is my kind of treaty. This is an agreement between, I think there's 45 indigenous nations from both sides of the border. National Park Service, uh, a bunch of agencies in the states signing a treaty to preserve the buffalo. Because when you bring back your buffalo on your reservation, you need to do more than that. There's 40 tribes that have buffalo herds now, right? But they need corridors, they need to roam, they need more land, they need national parks, they need to be able to like cruise around because they're buffalo, right? And that's what this treaty is. This is a treaty of for the buffalo, and I was, I got to go, I was a privilege to go to, the, to a signing in, in June of the, of the Buffalo Treaty. I was a witness. And um, this is another treaty, which is really about our future. This is a treaty called the Two-Row Wampum Treaty. It was between people out here, actually the Iroquois Confederacy and our people. It's a wampum belt. Y'all know what wampum belts are? You seem pretty good. Okay, uh, Don, no, I won't do that to you. <laughs> it is, uh, you know, it is made of cohogs. It is shells, and it's a, a way to record history and important events. Well, this treaty was recorded by white people, it was reaffirmed, but in 1706, there's a reaffirmation of this treaty, and the treaty is called the One Dish, One Spoon Treaty. And what that treaty is, is a treaty between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Anishinaabe people and our relatives here. And in that treaty, we said, we all eat from one dish. That a dish is Mother Earth. And so uh, we should take care of our dish. And we all uh, eat with one spoon. That is to say, in ceremonies, often you serve people, now we use sippy cups because of COVID, but you serve people with one spoon to show that you are relatives. And really, that is what food and seeds are about, this opportunity to understand that we have one dish and one spoon, and we should take care of our Mother Earth, our water, and our seeds for the future. I like this Zapatista proverb. They tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. And it is true. You know, it is so true. And in the case of seeds, as is in the case of Gete Okosaman, they last. They come back if you have faith and prayers and give them water and soil, they will return. In the case of our wild rice, my partner was out ricing yesterday on a lake where the rice had been diminished for 50 years, 50 years, Ogichi Lake. Another lake, 17 years, but it was because it was flooded out for white people's cabins. And they didn't want the rice, they wanted the lake shore for their bigger boats, right? You understand how this could happen, right? Well, they had a drought, and what came back? 50 years later, the wild rice, the seeds had laid dormant at the bottom of the lake. So I say believe in the seeds. Believe in those seeds because those seeds are about life. And this is what our work is under the Anishinaabe agriculture. So miigwech. I'm happy and thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer some questions, miigwech. Um, so we have time for, uh, is it on? On, no? Be this time? Now you can hear? Now? Okay. Um, so we have time for a couple. Sorry, I've never done this before. Um, so we have uh, time for a couple questions. Yeah. Um, yeah thank you so much. Um, 
I had a hemp question. So with the climate and the warming of the planet, my thought was that you could only raise hemp in a warm, a very warm environment, right? So if you researched hemp, India had a lot of hemp. I don't know if they still do. Um, so you're raising hemp in northern Minnesota. And how are you doing that in the winter? All right. So first of all, hemp grows everywhere. And our organization purchased a Russian seed collection last year. 71 varieties that were part of the Vavilov collection. Because it turns out that Russia, before prohibition, was the largest hemp grower in the world. Uh, it adapts. And in, in part, it's because it is so much daylight. So we're north, but we have a lot of daylight. So 70, 80 days, it loves it. And uh, so a lot of my work is in the agrobiodiversity of hemp and trying to scale seed varieties so that we can have, uh, you know, good, uh, good crops that are in our territory. And, and I'm sure that at some point we could probably do much more with it. I've been growing this year with the University of Minnesota. I grew out eight feral varieties for them. And... Uh, and so if you think about feral hemp, so it was criminalized in 1938. And so this, these hemp seeds hung out illegally for like 80 years, right? That's pretty cool. Huh? I was like, yeah, I want to grow them. So that's a resilient plant. It adapts. It grows like a weed. I mean, it figured out how to hang out. So I think it, that's why I think it is really, you know, a magical plant for the future. And I think everybody, you know, the USDA and like, I can't remember what year, a long time ago, like in the 1800s, required each farmer to grow a quarter acre of hemp and a quarter acre of flax. Yeah, it'll grow anywhere. Thanks for your question. That was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering what role you think universities should take in terms of supporting food sovereignty and working with local tribes, and what are some good stories you know from like tribal university partnerships? Okay, um, what do you think the, the role of universities is in supporting food sovereignty efforts, and do you know any good stories of like tribal university partnerships? You know, after the University of Minnesota's fiasco with the Green Revolution, I was kind of skeptical. You know, and I fought them on genetic engineering of wild rice, too. Because the University of Minnesota felt that it had a right to genetically engineer wild rice, and we fought them. Um, but uh, I have great partners at the U now. And the cannabis department, so funny. I think it's great that there's a cannabis department at the University of Minnesota, and the guys just like, I mean, they, of course, we, there's a big love fest, because you know what, it turns out, he came up to see me, and I mean, to me, I mean, you guys hung out with me for an hour. Like, I love farming, you can tell that. And our farms are happy farms, our plants are happy, right? And so he came up to see me, and he's like, he's looking at the hemp plants, and he's like, whoa! He's like, furthest north and largest plants. I was like, thank you. Every time someone comes to our farms, that's what they say. You know, so I believe that you can build a good partnership, but we had very carefully crafted agreements that we get to keep seeds. They don't own them. And in this, and in this the varietal development, like we need to grow out at a scale the 71 varieties. I mean, I have 71 varieties of Russian hemp. And I was like, how are we going to grow that? You know, so I am interested in partnerships, but I'm interested in retaining the seeds. Because, you know, I don't want to have my tribes be buying seeds and be in seed slavery in the future. And also we want to adapt the seeds. You don't want fewer. You want some varieties that you can harvest, you know, whether it is with a combine. I mean, we, we actually bought a combine. I never thought I'd buy a combine. I got combine, because if you're going to do 60 acres of hemp, you are not hand harvesting it. You need combine, you know, with a special gizmo. 
So you need partners. Universities need to do the right things, though, and not appropriate other people's stuff. And you're the place, like, this is an ag school. I thought that was great when I woke up and realized I was at an ag college. I was like, that's my kind of place. Grow some cool stuff. Figure out how to grow our future. That's what we got to do. You know, so universities are a good place to do that. Thanks for your question. Time for one more question. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, where, how much hemp do you harvest annually, and what happens to it after you harvest it? Do you sell it? Do you share it? Do you trade it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so to be clear about this, I've been a hemp farmer for seven years. I've been a corn farmer for 40, right? So I'm like just learning about hemp and I never grew marijuana. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I, you know, I was like, well, I could grow corn. Can I grow hemp, right? So I have federal and state permits. I've never grown a hot crop. Nothing's ever over 0.3% THC. But when they criminalized hemp, they basically destroyed all the infrastructure too. Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. We processed our own hemp into clothing, into textiles, into canvas for all those boats. You know, that's what we did in Minnesota. We had it down. And uh, then it was criminalized. And so then the industry is largely China's where if you get a hemp shirt today, it's from China. And they don't, uh, and they, they grow a fantastic crop, but they use all kind of chemicals to process it that are caustic. And so my interest is in, like, what did we do before all the caustic chemicals to process hemp? You know, and how do you process hemp? And, um, you know, the answer then was slavery. Because it's a highly, like, it takes a lot. But with mechanization, you don't need slaves, which is a good thing. You know, um, but there's still these questions about, so what I do is I cut it off the field. We use a sickle mower. We bale it into round bales, and then we sent our hemp to North Carolina, where these guys were figuring out how to build a decorticator, which is the thing you need to do to separate the herd from the fiber. Y'all got that part of class, right? Herd and fiber, right? So they run it through this giant, like, bust it up with, with like, uh, you know, just bust it all up thing, and then it's separated out, but it wasn't, it, you have to have it clean, it has to be good, and then you take it and the decorticated hemp, you have to degum it to make textiles. Patagonia, all of that stuff it needs. There's a gum, it's like pectin, it's, it's called lignin. And so that you gotta take off, that's what they're taking off with chemicals. These guys down in the southeast figured out how to do it in a non-chemical manner. Uh, we have worked with Navajo weavers who also have figured out how to do it. And they've made premium Navajo textiles. I was telling some people today that at the New York Fashion Week, some of my hemp was on a model's body. Came from some Navajo weavers. That's pretty cool, huh? I was like, that's it. That's it. And so my hemp went through this degumming process in Patagonia. It took my hemp and is producing 500 bags with it, with my hemp. That's cool, huh? So that's what I had to do. And um, I'm a slow and deliberate process person. Like, I didn't get into this for money. I got into this for love. And uh, a lot, that's one of the mistakes in agriculture and in cannabis, is people get into it for money. Don't get into, don't get into life for money. Get into it for love. You know, and so now I want to bring all that equipment to the north because I don't want to spend my time shipping my stuff across the country. And I think, you know, I'm working on getting to that. Uh, but the equipment had to be reconstructed and re-engineered. And there's a couple, you know, there's nobody in North America producing a textile yet. Everybody who's got one is getting it from China. But we, you know, I don't want to be the one person who produces it. I want 40 hemp facilities. Because if you're going to change the world, you need to not be the person making cool hemp doilies, <laughs> you know, the corner. You want, you want all the textiles out of it. So that's what happened to my last crop. And my next crop, I might, uh, I think I'm gonna, the Navajos and I are gonna make some fancy blankets out of it, or some of it, and some of it's gonna turn into housing. Thank you for your question.
Winona's hemp, you can look me up online on this Anishinaabe agriculture and keep track of our progress, our little slow learning. But it turns out we're right at the front. I feel pretty good about us. Good? Well, thank you so much. And that's all the questions that we have um, time for this evening. Um, I'm sorry, I keep breaking up. Um, thank you so much, Winona, for coming and sharing your wisdom like with us and your experience. Um, uh, you know, with growing hemp and with food sovereignty in um, Minnesota, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much for having me tonight.